Hey kids, it's the Drive to School podcast and uh, I'm Pastor Gooden. Joining me today is absolutely nobody. Uh, I have no friends at all today and so you are stuck with just me and I'm really bummed out about it too. But you know what I do when I'm really bummed out about something? I ponder the omniscience of God and why I'm so bad at transitioning between topics. Uh, when it's just me uh, this season, we're going to be tackling uh, important theological concepts and also why they matter how to talk about them. So today's is, um, what does it mean that God is omniscient? And why does it matter? God is omniscient. That's a word that means sort of all-seeing, all-knowing, which you know, makes sense on account of, like, if there's a God, he should, he should know stuff. He should be able to see what's going on, because God, the scriptures attest to it too. Uh, the 147th Psalm, great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. God, on account of being God, sees all the things and knows all the things. And on the surface, that's fine, but it's also something that sinners then get real uncomfortable with real fast. In fact, this is one of those things where um, we get really, really worked up about the idea that God is all-seeing because sinners hide. We, we hide our sin. We hide our sin from each other, those things that we're deeply ashamed of, deeply embarrassed about, that, that one time that you can not forget about. And you think about it when you look in the mirror. You think about it when you're trying to go to bed at night. You think about it in the shower and how you wish you could have done it all differently. God saw that. And um, if there is a God who then gets to also control what righteousness looks like, what the rules are, and what punishment is for breaking them, I don't know that I'm super comfortable with a God who is all-seeing, and all-knowing. In fact, you get a lot of uh, frustration about this, but the, the Psalms attest to this as well. Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it altogether. Which also changes a little bit about like why we pray, because it's not like we need to inform God of our problems. He already knows. He even knows how we're going to pray. He even knows what we're really thinking and what we actually want, no matter how much we sort of dress it up. Um, it's a profound chance to be honest with God, but it takes a lot of courage, um, or at least a lot of faith. Because here's the thing, if God really does see all those things in my heart, then he does see the things that I really want. And he does see the things that I really think. And um, I don't, I don't know that I like that. Um, and the other place that sinners really start to struggle with the idea of an all-seeing, all-knowing God is that like, there are places where it doesn't seem like he puts two and two together because he doesn't do the things that we would do if we were all-seeing and, and all-knowing. For example, uh, there's this tree of knowledge of good and evil where if you eat it, you die. And he puts it in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve are, and he knows. He knows that they're going to eat it he knows that they're going to die. So it leaves us with that question, why? Um, it, it leaves us with this frustration uh, because, yeah, God actually knew Adam was going to sin and eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and die. He knew that sin and suffering and death was going to come into the world. Um, and for this, it, again, takes a great deal of courage and really just a great deal of faith to confront this truth. But it also lets us talk a little bit about what the omniscience of God really is. Because when we talk about an all-seeing, all-knowing God, we tend to think about it at, like at this given point. God sees all things and knows all things. And like back then, he saw all things and knew all things. And in the future, he'll, he will see all things and will know all things. But here's the thing. Um, it, it's not just that God um, is, is sort of uh, seeing all things at any given point in time. He is seeing all of the things at all of the points in time at once. God is outside of time. We're not, so it kind of wrinkles your brain, but God saw all of the things from let there be light until the last great day when the trumpets sound all together. For him to be all-seeing and all-knowing, it's not that he is sort of along this ride and can predict the future. It's that he sees and knows all things and all times because he is God. God stands apart from time, and we who are bound by that struggle with it, but that means that God who saw Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden knew that they would eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that means that the things that happen, if God actually sees and knows all things at all times at once, isn't just sort of reacting. And like that leaves Jesus to sort of be a plan B because they, they messed up. Or, or even just that, that sort of this was God's plan all along to sort of let this thing play itself out. 
but it means actually for God to be all seeing and knowing in all times at once that the son was always the redeemer. And this is why it matters. You see, uh, there was never a point in time where the son of God was not the redeemer. Uh, Revelation says the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. You know, when the, the elect's names were written in the book of life, Ephesians 1 also ta- testifies to this, that before the foundation of the world, the elect were sealed in their salvation. That means that this was never sort of a plan B where God had to react. This was simply God exercising his will to save in time and space. And so he plays it out. It also means that if God is all-seeing and all-knowing, um, that means that when God sees and knows things, he doesn't see them sort of in order, but he sees them through the one place where time actually comes to a head for us as well. And that is where the Son of God redeemed us. See, if the Son was always the Redeemer, but we had to see it in time and space, then for us and for God, time centers around the cross where Jesus died for you and where Jesus died for me. Think about this. Everything. If the Son of God was slain before the foundation of the world, everything in time was leading up to the place in time where the Son of God would be slain, where Jesus would die on the cross for you and for me. This is always who God is. And so for us to finally see it, for him to actually play it out, is simply just where we can actually start to mark the center of all time and space. It, it, it's it's kind of sci-fi almost to talk about time and space when it comes to religion, but it matters. The center of time for Christians is when Jesus breathed his last and gave up his spirit and saved you. And for God too. Because God does not simply view Adam and Eve apart from the cross. God sees all things at once. That means when he saw Adam and Eve, he saw the cross. When he saw Cain pick up the rock to beat his brother to death, he saw Jesus dying on the cross. And that means that he saw Cain in mercy. He saw Adam and Eve in resurrection. He saw Cain in so much mercy that he, I don't know, put a mark on his forehead that nobody would kill him so that he would have time to hear of this uh, salvation, so that you have time to come to repentance and confrontation with God's law and rejoice in God's promise and in his gospel to forgive him. I wonder if that mark on his forehead was the mark of a cross. Uh, thought uh, All things that God sees are all at once, and that means that everything that God sees is through the lens of the cross. And then we can go backwards, not just to sort of like, why did God? Because God works all things according to, he wants to be the one to save you by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. But it also works for God sees you. Like he sees the things that you hide. He sees the things that you bury and the things that you excuse. And he really sees you, but he sees you through the light of the cross. So when God searches you, knows your inward parts, like the psalmist says, he sees you through the sacrifice of Jesus. He sees you through the sacrifice of his own son. And, and here you have something that matters. It matters that God is omniscient, that he is all-seeing and all-knowing, not just so that you know, we know that he's not reacting and sort of on his heels in the moment, but so that we can know how God sees us, not just that God sees us. God sees us how? Through the light of the cross, through the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, won for us by Jesus and delivered again in time and space through word and sacrament, through your baptism. See, your baptism tie you back to that cross. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, uh, through baptism into death in order that just as Christ is raised from the dead, we too may walk in newness of life. Time and space center around the cross. Your baptism ties you to the cross and the resurrection. And, well, if time and space center around the cross. That means if you feel cut off, if you feel alone, if you don't know what to do with today, and if you wonder whether or not God's plans are actually moving towards something, it's, it's that they're moving from something. They're moving from the cross towards the resurrection. And you're caught up in this. God sees you in the midst of this. He sees you through the cross. And so you can have great hope. It's, it's one more Psalm for the day, Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are toward their cry. See, God hears you. Um, he sees all of you, even the parts that, that you hide, but he sees you in light of the timeless cross where the son was slain for you, where he has conquered death, where he has forgiven sin, where he has defeated the devil. And, and so when the eyes of the Lord are toward you, they're not looking for things to punish, but they see you through the cross. And so they see you as righteous. They see you as holy. And, and so... Now, um, the eyes of the Lord see you in, in mercy. And so he answers in more of the same.
This is the Drive to School podcast. We're going to be tackling topics like these this year. So uh, like, subscribe, share it even, and uh, come back next time. Bye.